I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and want to encourage you, especially our audience in Ireland. Right now, we have a guest from Ireland joining us, that The Codist, uh, my book, second edition, ran out of the first printing, but we're making it available for you for just $2.99. It's now available on Kindle, $2.99 to everybody around the world. We're delighted to introduce you to our guest this morning, Alan Emerson, author of a book called Luminous Darkness, Leaning into Pain, Holding on to God, Breaking Through to Light. Alan, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Well, we're delighted to, to meet you. You're actually our first guest from Ireland. We've done many in uh, London, many guests around uh, the UK, but uh, you are our first guest from Ireland. So uh, we're delighted to be now be viewed uh, in Ireland and hope that uh, this becomes a regular viewing partnership between us. But you wrote this book uh, about uh, 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 this loss and faith. But before we get into the book, I kind of want to get to know you. This is the first time you and I have met. So I really don't know your story about growing up in Ireland, about family influences, and uh, you are the national director of the 24-7 Prayer in Ireland and a lead pastor at Emmanuel Church, a thriving young church. And is it Lurgan or Lurgin? Mm -hmm. Lurgan. Lurgan, yeah. Lurgan, Northern Ireland. You have a passion to see God do a new thing in Ireland. You're married to Rachel and have two daughters, Annie and Aaron. So who was young Alan Emerson? Uh, the one playing, what, Gaelic, Gaelic football? <laughs> no, it was soccer. It was soccer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's um, it's a privilege to be with you. My name's Alan, as you've said. I, I, I grew up um, just in the middle of the north of Ireland. Yeah, so if you look at the map, you'll see a lock uh, in the middle of it, which is like our way of saying lake, yeah, a freshwater lake. It's Loch Ness, and I was brought up on the shore of that lock um, in the countryside um, and um, my grandfather had a number of sons of which my dad is one and they all lived quite close to each other and he built uh, a little gospel hall so I was brought up um, in, a, in a sort of country brethren family kind of church and um, taught the scriptures and went to church three times on a Sunday and uh, all of that kind of thing uh, and then um, uh, you know, so a good influence in my life in terms of my own, my own personal family, my own mother and father and uh, grandparents and aunts and uncles, all, all were believers. And, um, and then we, we uh, you know, we had a, you know, a significant encounter of the Holy Spirit in our lives in, the, in the, my mid-teens. And you know, we started to go to um, another church uh, and then... Um, Long story short, my uncle, one of those kind of brothers of my dad's, he uh, was a, a lay preacher for many years, and he um, had gone through a number of difficult things, you know, lost his business and things like that, and um, had found himself dealing with a lot of broken people. Um, and at that particular point in uh, the town that we were living in, the, the nearest town, we didn't feel there was a, a church that was really suitable to bring a lot of these broken people and, uh, and so we just brought them to his house and uh, started a church really in his living room um, which we never really um, had a grand expectations was going to become a big church it was just trying to love people well who, um, who needed to know about Jesus and see their lives changed and transformed and uh, and so I was about 17 when that all happened. So I got kind of caught up in this young church plant and and really the church grew and multiplied. And, you know, I was rediscovering, I suppose, the faith that had been um, embedded into me really came alive for me around the same time as this, you know, in my own personal life. It's just really been captivated by the love of Jesus in a very strong way. The kind of stuff would move from my head into my heart at that age. And, uh, and so it was really exciting to be caught up in something that was hungering after the Lord, wanting to reach people that were outside of Christ and um, and yeah, just passionate about what we were doing. So over the next number of years then the church began to to multiply and to grow and I mean, we needed a building and then we needed another building and uh, and I suppose then it was into my 20s when I first met uh, 
first wife, Lindsay. So this calling into ministry, it was really birthed into you. This wasn't something that, that uh, it, was, it was a lifestyle. Uh, see, very different than here in the States where uh, somebody grows up in the church and then they go to seminary and then they, mm-hmm. they you know, they're, they're, yeah. either, they're either called to it because it's a vocation or job or it's a divine calling. Uh, for me, the divine calling came uh, in, in my 50s. Mm. Uh, I had already lived a f- very rich, robust corporate life uh, of 35 years and uh, after graduating college. So I was already later in life. I accepted the Lord uh, at 44, age mm-hmm. 44. So a very unusual story. But for you, it was a part of your DNA. Yeah, I, I suppose you could say it like that. Like I obviously had to work it out myself, you know, but um scriptures talk about working out your own salvation don't you but because i was so um i suppose embedded in church life um uh, there there needed to be a place where i needed to find the lord for myself you know somebody once said god god has too many grandkids you know people who become who kind of get uh who call themselves christians if you like simply because they've been nurtured in that faith um which is a great thing but you have to come to that awareness uh, in a very personal, real way, um, and so I, my earliest memory in life is becoming a Christian. I believe it was, it was, I was part of the family of God from as early as I can remember. But in terms of the, that sense of call and, and living um, for Jesus and wanting to uh, wanting to live a life kind of sold out for Him, that was instigated when I was about seventeen, I suppose, through a, just a deep sense of surrender, wholehearted surrender to the Lord. But in saying that, yeah, I think you're you're right too. It was part of my DNA because my my mom tells me that when the first thing that happened when I was born was like they prayed for me and gave me back to the Lord. So it felt like I, I was never going to get away from it, really. <laughs> it's interesting, you know. As you tell the story, you talk about your uncle bringing broken people in, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and. Uh, I'm sure that at no point in time did you ever see yourself being mm-hmm. anything but ministering to broken people as opposed to becoming one of mm-hmm. the broken people. Mm-hmm. So how God kind of orchestrated a little bit of your backstory is your exposure to brokenness uh, was more to minister to uh, looking at it from the standpoint of I have something to give to help to help heal, uh, to tell them about the Jesus that came to bind up the brokenhearted and set the captives free. I found that at 17, I, I didn't have to go through brokenness. Um, mm. I had my own questions, my own struggles, but then you came to that decision for yourself and you made it a part of your life. Where and how did you meet Lindsay? Yeah, so uh, at that church then, um, in our first building, I was leading leading worship at the time, and she kind of came into the building and you know, caught my eye, as we say in Ireland. And uh, um, I didn't know her, but was drawn to her. And uh, so I began to pray about it. She um, she came to started to come to our church with her family, and we got to know each other a little bit. But I was doing like the youth pastor role at the time, so I was being careful about. Um, how much of uh, me was showing that I was feeling, you know, attracted to her and drawn right. to who she was. So I was trying to like navigate all of that. Um, and so we kind of prayed about it for about a year and I got to know her a little bit. And, and then after a year, we had a conversation about expressing our feelings for one another. She was 18, I was 22. And uh, we started to, uh, yeah, we started to date really then. Um, uh, and we went, we uh, we did it for around two years and uh, fell in love. Uh, she, she was, we were both obviously young. She had started to go to university and um, yeah, she, she spent a lot of her summers like I did in, in Africa and uh, on different mission trips and things. Um, and so that was a big part of her heart. And kind of as we, as we grew in love for one another, we grew in love for living a life of adventure really um, 
we were taken by a scripture in John chapter 3 that says, you know, the spirit is like the wind and no one knows what it blows. No one knows where it blows from or it blows to, but you can you can feel it, you can sense it. And we were captivated by the idea of being blown by the spirit of God um, wherever he wanted to take us. So uh, we eventually got married in 2005, June 2005, and we incorporated this scripture into our into our vows that we wanted to be blown by the wind of God. And we covenanted to God and to one another that that's how we'd live our lives together. Um, and it didn't just felt like it couldn't get any better. So when did uh, things begin to change? Well, on the, in the context of that particular scripture, you know, then we, we got on with really living our lives for the first year like that. And at the end of the first year of marriage, coming into the summer of 2006 because we'd had such a link with Africa in different ways in our hearts we really wanted to establish a long-term mission connection with our own church that was growing and so we brought 40 people out there and really connected with a local pastor out there who had had a primary school partially built for him and we were finishing that as well as just developing a deep sense of love and communion and oneness and um, and so we had a brilliant time we spent a whole month there and that was how we wanted to live our lives. So in many ways, it felt like we were living the dream. But when we came home from that trip in, Ju- in st- July, sorry, 2006, uh, she started to get really sore heads, and we couldn't get to the bottom of those for weeks. And then after a month, or one month or so, she um, she was taken to the hospital to have a brain scan just to check that um, we could basically rule everything we needed to out. Um, but that brain scan started to reveal that she had a growth in her brain, which was a brain tumor. And so we were told the news on a on a Monday afternoon in September 2006 and told just to basically come straight back to the hospital. And they got us ready. And by the end of that week, she was having open brain surgery um, to have the tumor removed. Um, and so that happened... Um, at the end of the week that we first found out and um she initially recovered very well from that first operation and the brain surgeon told us that he'd done a really good job that he got 95 percent of the tumor but crucially hadn't been able to get the last five percent because it was so deep in her brain but he did say that he felt that it was at this particular point he felt it was benign and we should get on with trying to live out our dreams and enjoy um, the life that we had together so we were pretty positive after the first brain surgery and um, that was in uh, yeah as i said that was in september 2006 and then but then by christmas that year we were just getting ready to have uh, some th- uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy and then she had two seizures and then having those seizures quite quickly we didn't did another brain scan and realized the tumor had grown back. So they did another round of brain surgery. Um, then had six weeks of chemo, six weeks of radiotherapy. And, and during that time, we were really hoping and, and praying that that would work. And obviously, fueled by all the prayers of God's people, we were feeling a peace, you know, a peace that hopefully she would make it. Um, um, and that... Um, yeah, and, and during that time, we, you know, but but the, the therapy obviously took its toll on her body, and you know, she started to lose her hair, and she started not to be able to not to be able to wash or bathe herself, and so so I found myself, you know, basically looking after her full time, almost with the help of her family. Um, but I suppose in that time she got steadily worse when I look back in retrospect, and then it was uh, April two thousand and seven. So about eight or nine months after she was initially diagnosed that she died. So here you are, a man of faith. Mm-hmm. God answers your dream of, of uh, finding your soulmate. Mm-hmm. Uh, you share a ministry calling together. You have a heart for Africa. You have a heart for missions. You have a heart for the Lord. And all of a sudden you're dealt with the most devastating mm. possible of scenarios. Mm-hmm. While this is going on, you have a family of faith surrounding you, a community mm. rallying uh, behind this cause, and your 
you find yourself as a caregiver. Mm -hmm. uh, were you questioning God at this time? Were you walking boldly in confidence and faith that he was going to heal her? And in that confidence, how did you react when the final breath was taken and you had to come to grips with the fact that she was healed, but not the way you wanted her healed? Yeah, um, yeah there's a few questions in there. So I think first and foremost in her in her sickness, um, I, I was quietly confident. I wouldn't say I was uh, uh, kind of naming and claiming or healing, um, for want of a better phrase. But I had a peace, you know, and I didn't ever think she was going to die. I suppose it didn't really. Uh, I wasn't in denial. I just had had a peace, you know. And I think that peace came from the prayers that people had been praying for me. Um, so in retrospect, again, I think the prayers that we wanted, you know, for Lindsay's physical healing were, you know, were met in the tent in the, in the sense of the, the peace that we carried through her sickness. And I suppose the thing that that um, that, that they also fueled was a was it just a really deep love for one another. Um, uh, I think I tasted something of the love of heaven, the purity of a holy love that um I just felt an intensity of love for my wife who couldn't give me anything back in return. And I, you know, I never, I never expected in my life that I'd ever experience anything like that, but it was the deepest, deepest thing um, that I've ever experienced. It was such a, it was such a purity of, of loving for somebody. And so I felt this desire to care for her and to look after her and, and all of those things. So so I felt a peace un, un, until probably about two weeks before she died when her speech and everything started to deteriorate as well. And the nurse and consultant had spoken to me and said, listen, Alan, we really need you to know that Lindsay's really sick. And at that point, they knew that this wasn't, this, this wasn't good. <laughs> and so I, um, I started to I started, I'd already been partially fasted, but I started to fast. I fasted for 13 days, um, never ate not, never ate anything, and just really cried out to God. But the more I prayed, the worse she seemed to get. Um, and so I uh, I had a moment with the Lord um, at our bedside where I was uh, just recognizing, you know, just really really just pouring out my heart to the Lord and saying, God, there's nothing more I can do. I've, I've, I've done everything I can, you know, uh, but I'm not, I'm not giving up. Uh, this is not me being resigned to the fact she's not going to make it, but uh, equally I need to try and recognize that you, you're in this with me, even though it's really difficult to see that. And I'm going to trust that you love her more than I love her, even though, <laughs> even though I want to kind of debate that at the moment, I'm trusting in the fact that you love her more than I do. And so um, it was kind of like playing tug of war with God. It was it was my own Gethsemane moment, I suppose, where I don't, I'm not giving up, you know, but you're well be done kind of thing. So that moment happened about a week before she died. Um, so in some ways... Looking back, it was good to have that moment with the Lord, but in saying that, at the time, it was no solace whatsoever. Um, and I suppose where it thrust me into was a place where this kind of the, the, the purity of the love that I've just described um, tasted a bit like heaven. Um, when she died, it felt like I tasted something of hell, of hell because the separation from the love uh, which I think hell is all about, you know, yes. separation from love, the love that you probably taste. You know, I just the God forsakenness, if you like, of that moment felt felt like a, a glimpse of of hell and just the torment of the object of all of your affection, um, not being there and not being there for the rest of this life. Uh, it was just a deeply disorienting, tormenting, painful time. At any point in time, did you find yourself angry with God? Really questioning his 
wisdom, his sovereignty. Why would you take this from me? These are all the natural questions mm -hmm. that I would think that any person would ask. I've, mm -hmm. not, I've not experienced it myself, so uh, my compassion, uh, my, my understanding is that sorrow is not forever, that love mm -hmm. is, but in the moment, uh, mm -hmm. sorrow seems like forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really hard. It's really hard to understand unless you've been there. But because um, a lot of the things that you think uh, as a believer, uh, as a Christian, uh, and maybe even worse as a leader in the church, um, a lot of the things that you think are almost, you know, you can almost think they're blasphemous or something, you know. But, you know, even heaven in those early days didn't feel like any sort of sense of consolation. You're so consumed by the absence of somebody that you've loved so deeply that you can't actually find consolation almost in in where they are. You know, people used to say things, at least you know where she is. And I used to say back to them, well, all I all I can think about where she, where she isn't anymore. Yeah. And so so those are all the very real emotions that it's hard to understand unless you've you know you've been there. Um, but yes, I, I think my, my 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 most difficult emotion when it came to my faith was wasn't so much anger, although there was some of that. It was just a deep, deep sense of disappointment with God, because um, I loved God, you know, and it wasn't like I I felt like I'd had significant encounters of God's Father heart, God's God's love, and. And so um, to tell somebody that you love, like God, that you're disappointed in them was quite a disorientating thing for me. But I had to tell them. And uh, and I did. You know, I found myself just, uh, it felt like God was giving me a permission to express the emotions of my heart in the truest way and that that was okay. You know, you experienced a loss that none of us ever want, ever dream of, ever think about. Uh, it's easy for us to offer comfort, what we think is comfort. But as you said, uh, it is very common for someone to offer a word of comfort that says, well, at least you know where she is. But mm -hmm. as you so eloquently stated, all you could think about was where she wasn't. Yeah. Not about totally. where she was. Mm -hmm. And the words that we think are comforting. Oh, well, you you know where she is and, and you'll see her again. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to see her again. I want to see her now. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, I, I know what you think you're saying you think is offering me comfort, but I really want to punch you in the face because I, I'm struggling with this loss. You're going to walk out the door and go back to your normal life, and I'm never going to know. I have a new normal now, and that new normal has put me at odds with my faith. It's put me at odds with my God. It's mm -hmm. put me at odds with my reality. And as I read in your book, you found yourself moving back home. Mm -hmm. And unpacking and... Mm -hmm asking that question, how, how did I wind up in this place? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think back to your uncle and mm -hmm. to your uncle bringing in the broken. Mm -hmm. And now you had become one of the ones that you were ministering to. Yeah. Now you were one who had become the broken one. Mm -hmm. But you had a community. And yeah, you, and you talk about that community. Mm -hmm. um, how does one get through? And uh, you know, uh, your publicist wanted, wanted suggested I ask you why luminous dark uh, mm -hmm. as a title. I, I think I completely understand why the title, because uh, I I just have this complete sense that when you had your breakthrough of uh, becoming reconciled and having a Rachel come into your life mm -hmm. and God answering some of the prayers 
and having one who now was able to give you what you longed for, that love, being to be loved back, uh, was an encouragement to you that even in the darkest of times there is a light that is mm -hmm. a luminous darkness that, mm -hmm. that it was consuming. Uh, but how does one get through this? How did mm -hmm. you, in uh, your questioning and what you quote unquote might seem blasphemous, mm -hmm. how, did you, how did you find yourself processing that and working through it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, I, I had this kind of uh, had this intuitive sense that the only way I was going to get through it was to be honest, first and foremost. And and uh, I was encouraged by the thought that this honesty in in all of the emotion uh, could be prayer. Um, and I I remember saying to God, God, I can't, you know. I can't one day do interviews like this where I can give you glory for how you brought me through if I can't tell you right now how I'm feeling. And it felt like the only, otherwise my healing would have been fake, I think, and um, dressed up in kind of platitudes and stuff like that. And so I, it felt like I had to be true to the deepest parts of what I was feeling and experiencing. And I needed to tell God those things, even though it felt disconcerting at times, because these aren't the sort of prayers that we pray in church. But what I came to discover was that these are the kind of prayers that are prayed in the Bible. Yes. And that the church isn't very good often at incorporating these prayers into our gathered times, um, or, or even giving us the permission to really grieve. Um, and so, you know, I, one of the other phrases that a lot of people said to me was, you know, at least we know God's in, it's good to know God's in control, though. And it, it strikes me as an interesting kind of uh, uh, observation of the even, you know, ev evangelical Christianity in the West that we're kind of insulated from suffering a lot of it. And so we all go quickly to the God who's in control because in some ways that just gives us a relief that at least somehow there's some control in this. And that's not untrue. You know, God is in control and we're so glad that he is. But what we miss in times of suffering is the what, what I would describe as the co-suffering nature of who God is and, and uh, obviously how he revealed that in Jesus. Um, and so as I entered into these kind of really dark, dark nights of the soul, um, I started to realize that Jesus co-suffered with me, that he was carrying my pain. And that in order for me to be fully healed of this, I needed to allow the pain to do what it needed to do in me. I needed to let it go through me. And I need to express that as, um, I needed to express that in all its emotion before God. And so I found the Psalms, Job, Lamentations as what I would describe as soul, soul articulation for the times when my own pain was so deep that I couldn't find words. And so these these scriptures give me words when I couldn't find my own, really. Um, and they allowed me to process, at least at least, at least least in these scriptures, somebody got me. Um, most of the rest of contemporary kind of worship music and all just wasn't getting it. It wasn't, right. <laughs> it wasn't touching the depths of pain that I was carrying or the depths of grief. It wasn't providing language for questioning and disappointment and all of that all of all of those mishmash of emotions and so leaning into my pain finding help in the scriptures to do that um helped me to start ever so slightly lifting the weight of the, the it's like a physical weight grief of this acuteness to so help me to start lifting that lifting that weight off me ever so slightly and also realizing that within that, that Jesus was meeting me. And and it wasn't in like a cozy form of intimacy. It was like an eerie, almost kind of mysterious way. I would nearly describe it to more of a wrestle with the Lord, a bit like, a bit like Jacob and the Lord wrestling. It was, a, it was that, I'm, 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 not, I'm not letting you go, Lord, and, until you bless me. And, and uh, but knowing that... Um, 
the silence the while I wasn't getting qu- while I wasn't getting answers to my questions that the silence didn't mean absence uh, that his his presence enveloped the silence and and uh, and just yeah just sat with me in the in the place in the place of pain I think that's how, that's how I start I, like I like it I, I, the metaphor I use, I suppose, even in the subtitle, is almost like of walking through a dark tunnel, and you know, not even at the start being able to see the light, but just believing that it must be there because light is at the other end of tunnels. But also uh, recognizing the fact that in order to get there, you you have to go into the middle part of the tunnel, which is obviously the, probably the most bleakest. And so it's it, it's it's that idea. It's embracing the idea. It's probably going to feel slightly worse until it gets better, and that. But the only way to actually get to the light, uh, in a way that's going to be transformed fully, is to lean, to lean into that pain, uh, and allow it, allow it to work its way through you, rather than try to subdue it. Because I think the other key thing I learned and I talk about in the book is if that pain isn't transformed, it will be transmitted. Somebody else will get your pain at some point, unless you've kind of wholly, wholly lit it up before the Lord and allowed Him in prayer to transform it. You know, when you talk about this, there's a certain sense in the book of coming to a point of acceptance and then releasing it back, back to God. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, this. You reach that point of the darkest place, and then you begin to, you enter into it, but then you emerge from it, mm-hmm. and that's the the the. In, in the book, you just capture the, the raw emotion, uh, and the way you tell it. You also went back to. <clears throat> some of the the influences i think you talked about um you know god in the silence c.s lewis uh Mm -hmm. a grief observed Uh, these were the old steady uh, others have gone through this and Mm -hmm. and come through it and have written about it uh maybe i need to take a, a a moment to reflect on god's word as opposed to my feelings, mm-hmm. is that where you got to in this? Yeah, what I would say is I, I find a reference point in the scriptures uh, for my feelings. <laughs> so, um, you know, which which is part of my passion for writing the book because I think I found a resource, a wealth, if you like, a resource, a treasure chest uh, for. Uh, every emotion basically under the sun is contained in the Bible, particularly in the book of Psalms, and it's all prayer. So I think it would be a it would be a, a better way of saying it. it would be like I found a reference point in the scriptures for my feelings, and as I read them, and as I even voiced them audibly, they became language for the for the brokenness of, of of my soul and like you know there's parts of the scriptures are raging with emotion it's not like some mild sanitized domesticized kind of book that we've often made it in the church it's uh it's wild it's wild and uh it's 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 full of rage anger injustice um disappointment all of those things but it's all prayer <laughs> that's the beauty of it it's all prayer and I think what I started to learn was you can either make a choice where there you can you can you can pour it all out before the face of the father or you can kind of keep it behind where he can't get to it and if you, if you're choosing to lay it before him it doesn't really matter how it comes out it's all prayer and the prayer of praise um, isn't any more valid than the prayer of pain it's all worship before the Lord you know, you've ca- you've captured something that I think that uh, the modern church today doesn't address. Mm-hmm. Things like wailing, <clears throat> gnashing of teeth. Mm-hmm. These are vile, violent responses to circumstance. Mm-hmm. They're rage, and, and mm-hmm. uh, we see it throughout Scripture. 
uh, the, the mourning, the renting of a garment. The, uh, um, imagine <clears throat> Jacob, his lament upon hearing that his son Joseph uh, has mm -hmm. died. Uh, mm -hmm. You step into that, you have raw, complete mm -hmm. emotion. You have the tearing of the garment. It was God's response when Jesus breathed his last. He tore the garment, rent the garment, the curtain mm -hmm. from top to bottom. A mm -hmm. sign that this was a father mourning for his, own, his only son. Uh, mm -hmm. He tore that garment the same way that Jacob tore his own garment. We see the renting of the garment. This is something that even today, uh, symbolically, we take a black ribbon and we put a cut in that ribbon because we have entered into a dark space Mm -hmm. And we acknowledge a dark space. Rabbis wear black. Uh, we wear black uh, as a traditional sign of mourning for the destruction of the second temple. So when you look at this garment of mourning, this being dressed and clothed and robed in darkness, because mourning is a dark process. Grief is a dark mm -hmm. process. And uh, Jesus talks to us about the light. Uh, mm -hmm. We look throughout the scriptures of the light. Uh, this is that luminous dark mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you've grabbed a hold of with such passion and emotion. Uh, you've 18 months later met uh, mm -hmm. Rachel. Um, God uh, carried you through a very, very difficult season of your life, but that doesn't mean that uh, grief isn't a part of every day in some form or fashion. Uh, and it took you how many years between Lindsay's passing and the publishing of, of uh, this book? Uh, ten years before it was published. Tenure. Yeah, so I think I think like you know what I would say is that the, the title, you know, you know, as I lend into that darkness, I suppose what I've described is that is most of the early days of the pouring out of emotion. I think as I did that, then there was a degree of luminosity, if you like, that started to kick in. And when I say luminosity, what I mean is there's things that we can learn, if learn in the dark about ourselves that we don't learn necessarily in the light when i say light and that i'm not talking about i'm talking about light as in uh, the, the good days if you like right. um but there's things that we can learn about ourselves in the dark um and, and the reason ultimately we can we can learn things about ourselves in the dark days as we would describe them is because jesus has gone into the dark days and he went lower than anybody has ever gone um uh, and went to the darkest place anyone has ever gone to. There's no darkness that we have experienced that he has not yet experienced. And so the psalmist could say that even the darkness is as light to you. Um, and so even though it feels incredibly dark to us, and I felt a permission from God to express that darkness, the greater truth is that even that darkness is as light to Jesus. There's 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 stuff that can be mined, luminosity that can be mined in these dark days. And uh, and God's gentle with us. He doesn't force that on us. But as we grieve, and I think that's the that's the importance. You know, the ecclesiast. There's a time for grieving. Yes. You know, as we grieve, then and as we grieve properly, rather than trying to stunt the grieving process or restrict it or immobilize it. Um, but rather fully grieve it, then a degree of perspective and luminosity starts to come. And so I started to find that I started to get perspective about my life, about my faith, about some of the reconstruction that needed to happen in my own faith, you know, some of the truth that can actually only be found in paradox and not in the kind of black and white way we love to compartmentalize our lives. So you started to learn, learn so much about, um, the beauty and wonder of who God is over and above the way I wanted him to answer my prayers, you know. So, um, so you know, I suppose that was one of the things that I, that was one of the, 
real reasons why I wanted to call it the, the, the book Luminous Dark is because I learned so much about who God is um, over and above the constructs that I had boxed him into. I learned so much about who I am um, in light of that. And, and I and I learned a, a, you know, like a fresh wonder of the world again, you know, that God had put me in because um, it was being like reborn, really, because it felt like, you know, the person that completed me had, had died, you know, and with that, it felt like most of me had died as well. So coming back to life, if you like, felt like, you know, felt like a fresh wonder started to slowly but surely kind of permeate my life. So you process this in a way that you went to the depths mm -hmm. of understanding mm -hmm. of what it was like to walk in David's shoes, mm -hmm. what it was like to lament the loss of, in mm -hmm. his case, a son, uh, the, the loss of the Bible uh, it escapes many people. Uh, we tend to emphasize the greatness, the goodness, the grace, the mercy, the sanctification, the redemption, all of these wonderful things. But when we go back and we see the suffering and mm -hmm. we see the reality of life that uh, over a period of 40 years in the wilderness, families watched an entire generation die. Every mm -hmm. child born in the desert, buried their parents, every mm -hmm. one of them. This is 40 years of constant death of, mm -hmm. of 600,000 men. It means every family had to experience uh, in a very short period of time a greater rate of death than we have in modern day even with the billions of the population. So it's something that uh, is gripping about the Bible, mm -hmm. uh, about this holding on just even to the hem of his garment mm -hmm. uh, and not letting go. And uh, uh, your story that you tell uh, in the book about not letting go, that you really were wrestling with God, whether mm -hmm. or not it was calling him out for taking your, the love of your life from you to saying, I can't do this without you. Mm -hmm. So uh, now you meet Rachel. Mm -hmm. And what happens? Because now someone comes into your life. You're, you're a young widower, mm -hmm. uh, very young widower in a most unexpected place, a most unexpected position, robbed, cheated, stolen of the love of your life. Uh, how, how does one open one, one's heart again and mm. realize that God really is sovereign and that he does give us the desires of our heart if they're in line with his desires for our heart mm. how, how, um, how did this come yeah about? so uh, i think you know as hope as hope started to stir i was obviously incredibly nervous about never meeting anyone again and wondering if it could happen and, but but as i did that whole grieving process i talked about you know uh, and really you know in the early days you could never imagine ever touching another person again never mind um, being married to somebody else, you know, but uh, as I really processed the pain and, and really was true to the grief, you know, after numbers of numbers of weeks um, and months, I suppose there was an element of hope started to stir again and you could, you could find yourself feeling, you know, attracted to a girl here and there and, and but yet, you know, often that led to disappointment because they just weren't Lindsay. <laughs> you know? um, and so, you know, I would, you know, but I would just pray that God would, you know, lead me and guide me and all of that and tr trust that he still had the best for me. I think really, really one thing that was really difficult for me in the early days was just it just felt like the rest of my days were going to be second best. And I think, 
you know, I had to try and really activate my faith muscles by saying either your word is true, God, or it isn't true. So either you do bring all things and work all things together for good or else that's just a nice little refrain that we stick on a sympathy card. You know, either either you will bring beauty out of ashes or else, you know, this is this, there's no sitting on the fence anymore. Either it is or it isn't. And so I, I think I've, I found myself just staking myself on the promises of God and saying, right, God, I'm, I'm going to choose to believe this stuff even when I don't feel like believing it. And uh, and so with, with that kind of trying to stir that faith, not, not in... Like you know, not in, in in some kind of false or fake way, but just trying to activate faith. Um, I started to find that um, hope started to stir. I think it's interesting. A faith, hope, and love, you know, work together. And uh, and so then when I met Rachel, I just you know I was drawn to who she was in in a similar way to 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 how I was with Lindsay. But you know, obviously it was different and. You know, we we had a couple of conversations and it's led to a couple of dates and and then we started to chat about my situation and I wanted to give her freedom to kind of walk away from it because it was um, obviously complicated for her. You know, she'd never been married before and um, had honoured God in her life and with relationships and stuff. So it wasn't easy for her whatsoever. But in saying that, she dealt with it with a lot of grace and a lot of dignity. And I slowly but surely, I found myself just in a whole new season of life starting to fall for somebody else again. And I suppose it was realizing that one chapter of my life had fully closed. And while this was still the same story, it was a, a whole new chapter was opening up. And in this season of my life, Rachel was going to be the best for me, and uh, and she's proven to be that, you know, for eight years now, and um, we're we're you know we're really happy, and I couldn't imagine being any more happy than I am now, and completed and whole, and um, living my life with fresh purpose and and and, and destiny. So this story is a story of life, death redemption, renewal, Mm -hmm. and a born-again experience of Mm -hmm. a life remade into a new image. Because now you have where you had sympathy and compassion for the broken. You now have empathy because you've been through this Mm -hmm. experience, which allows you to minister in a much more personal and profound way. Yeah. Knowing what to say and mm-hmm. what not to say. Knowing mm-hmm. that it's just a hand on the shoulder and an unspoken word mm-hmm. offers more comfort than a soliloquy or a passage of scripture or mm-hmm. a trite quote or comment. But mm-hmm. that's that warm hand on the shoulder or that tight hug that allows for a release of weeping and allowing you to go into a period, a season of despair, but knowing that you're surrounded by Aaron's and hers who are going mm-hmm. to lift up your arms mm-hmm. so that the victory belongs to the Lord. That's mm-hmm. the story of a life lived, a life lost, a life reborn, mm-hmm. a life today that you're living and that you can love again you can find love again and it's all through trust in god yeah now you're able to truly do what you said how can i give an interview about the goodness and the graciousness and the love of god Mm -hmm. if i don't actually experience it and receive it and find myself in this place And Mm -hmm. so I want to thank you. Thank you for sharing this very personal story. The book is called Luminous Dark, and I recommend this book highly. Uh, You'll smile, you'll cry, but you'll understand the real love of God in his word. You'll understand how to live a life with God 
where mm. you can be as raw and emotional as you need to be because God already knew all along his plan for you. And it's not always in line with your expectation, but he will give you exceedingly and abundantly beyond all your expectation if you do exactly what Alan Emerson did, and that was let go and let God take control of his life, his emotions, his heart, and bring him a new life that he can continue to minister for the Lord in a very, very, very rich personal way. Alan Emerson, author of Luminous Dark, Leaning Into Pain, Holding On to God, Breaking Through to Light. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us here on Revealing the Truth. Thank you. God bless you, my friend. We're going to take a short bless break. You. And when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.